Thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. It's uh, the end of October, almost the end of October, and I'm again starting out in the herb garden. This is a walk in the garden, an NCTV show. We have been with you since about the end of March, following the garden year in my garden in Norfolk. Today I'm in the herb garden, which has been cut down of all the herbs that I'm going to be cutting down. Uh, I've left the sage, the southern wood, of course the roses will wait until spring, and some of the other ones like sage are also still available to be picked, and we can continue to pick those right up through Thanksgiving. The leaves will actually do somewhat, and then they'll come back in the spring. So we leave that one standing. Uh, the same with the southern wood, I will cut that back in the spring. One of the things you need to do in the fall is take down the bird feeders, or the bird houses, I'm sorry, bird houses, and clean them out. And for this task, I need a screwdriver. And I also need a face mask. Uh, opening up bird houses and the bird droppings can be a problem if you breathe in that dust. So I'm gonna put on the mask and be quiet as I do my job, or sort of quiet. It may be muffled a bit, but it's a safe way to go. Most birdhouses have some screws or a door that opens on a hinge. This one has two screws. And then it has a little panel that flips right up. At that point, you can remove all the contents of this birdhouse, and the birds did use it. It's probably a wren. We want to clear it out and then I'll wash the birdhouse out, wash it well and store it in my garden shed. I can remove my mask now. And stick it back in my pocket. But all the birdhouses need to be done before winter. Uh, they do attract mice sometimes if left out, which is why I like to take them in. There's nothing more disgusting than opening them up in the spring to find a nest of mice. So I like to take as many in as I can and leave open some of the others so that nothing can make a nest in it. The other thing that we can do, I have a few, if you have any annual herbs, I have two in here left, and that would be a, uh, scented geranium, and I'm just going to pull it and put it in the compost, and also the lemon verbena. And unfortunately, though I love this plant, it does not make it through the winter. And rather than waiting for it to leaf out in the spring, I like to get rid of the annual herbs while I know what they are. There's also a few nasturtiums in here, and they won't last either. This garden is ready to be raked. Uh, it's much easier to rake out a garden if you cut down the perennials first, and that's what I've been doing. The raking is yet to come, and it makes it just a lot easier to get the raking done. Let's move over to the perennial garden. In the perennial garden, it's time again to cut things back so that you can easily rake. And this is a peony still has foliage on it, but it does need uh, cutting back. 
I find it easier to cut the things back while the supports are still on them. And you can just kind of lift the whole thing out if you cut all the stems. And gone is my basket. This is serious work that requires the garden cart. You'll notice I had the support in there. You couldn't really see it. But those will be stacked over near my compost for the winter. And there's a few weeds in here, too. And those can come down. I'm going to leave the coral bell, or hookera, just as it is all winter. And also the chrysanthemum will be left. It still has a few blooms on it. And uh, we will be covering those next month after we get the ground pretty much frozen. Here's another lemon verbena, and that one's going to get pulled. It's a two-hand job because, again, it will not come back. I have a small rose that still has a few blooms on it. I'm not going to cut them off at this point. I'm going to let it uh, prepare itself for winter this, at this point. This is a uh, chrysanthemum that I put in this fall, and it will not make it in this basket. Therefore, I will be pulling it right out of the basket and leaving some of the dirt in the basket. And later on, I may fill the basket with greens as a holiday decoration. So I'll leave the basket there, but I will take the plant out and compost it. The asters are also gone. Most of them have been cut down and will continue cutting this one. One more plant to cut are the iris, and I've cut most of this uh, bunch of iris. It, it's a patch about as big as my arms are in a circle, and I've cut most of it, but I cut that back in the fall. You can wait till spring, but I find they get really mushy, and I don't like working in, on a cold day with mush. And we've had some really nice days here, so I just cut these back to the ground. And it also gives you a chance to pull any weeds that have gotten into the centers of these groupings. And it neatens up the garden for your spring bulbs. I'll cut back my regular iris at the same time. It, the leaves will die back on their own. This year we've been pretty late in not having a frost, so I'm cutting back a lot of things a little early than I, uh, or a little early in their life stage than I necessarily would otherwise. And again, there's a few grasses in here that we can pull out. I'll leave the uh, lamb's ears, and they should be OK. We should be seeing foliage at the bottom of the chrysanthemums that have been planted since spring. There should be a nice little tuft of foliage at the base of those. You probably won't find it on ones you put in this year unless you put them in early. But if you find a nice tuft of foliage at the base, it means the plant has put down roots and should come back next year if protected this winter. Another thing to do is to work on the deer spray again. Deer spray. Uh, is good in the winter as well. And I neglected to get out here, and I lost a hydrangea's leaves. The deer came in, and having not protected it with the spray, uh, they did a pretty good job on it. I think it'll come back next spring, but I need to be careful and go around my edges of all shrubs, especially the uh, rhododendrons, and just give them a nice coat of deer spray before winter sets in. Incidentally, this is a tree peony, and while I cut the regular peony, the herbaceous peony, back, I will not do anything with the tree peony. It will lose its leaf stems and its leaves, but it will sit here. It becomes a more permanent structure. 
So the tree peonies do not get pruned, just raked up around the edges. And again, they don't seem to be too attractive to deer, but I'll probably spritz it anyway. Uh, at this point, I leave the Autumn Joy sedums because they have a nice blossom that persists into winter for a while. And I'll probably use some of these in some of my Christmas arrangements as dried flowers. I'll just let them dry naturally. My annual salvia is still blooming, so I'll leave that a little bit too. It just depends uh, what's still blooming. Most of the garden has been cleared. And uh, the rest of it will be cleared pretty much before snow sets in, we hope. Okay, on to the vegetable garden. We haven't really had a hard, hard frost, but we've had enough frost to kill the marigolds. So they're gonna get pulled. And again, shaken off and added to the compost pile. The compost pile is growing. Along the way, I'll probably find quite a few of the garden stakes that I used to tie the strings, and I'm going to save those. I'll put them, set them aside and then put them in a flower pot to save over the winter. We still have calendulas blooming. They last quite a long time and can take quite a lot of cold. There's a lot more cold weather scheduled for this weekend, and they may go then, but I'll leave them until they do. I'm still getting a few other things, too. There's a little lettuce that came up voluntarily. And of course we have pars a parsley. The spinach is hanging in there. The perpetual spinach has been a great crop. It's kind of a cross between spinach and chard. Not quite as bitter as chard, not quite as tender as spinach, but it's been a good crop all season. Parsley, of course, is still going and that will continue. I will leave the parsley in the garden when we plow it because it will come up next spring. So if you have parsley, don't take it out in the fall. Don't pull it with the rest of the vegetables. Leave it and it will uh, come up again in the spring. As we've mowed the lawn, we have a lot of crushed leaves and those are going to go on the garden and get uh, spread out and tilled into the soil. This will add uh, valuable matter to it and it's kind of like composting in place. Having the leaves ground up really helps. So you can see there's uh, quite a few and we'll keep adding them as long as we keep mowing. Once we're, everything is out of the garden that's coming out, uh, we'll till it for winter and leave it just loosely tilled for the winter. I'm still picking a few things. Uh, Pyrosacaba is one of the things and this was a new plant to me this year. What I learned is that I should plant it earlier indoors and set it out because I'm just getting my crop here in the fall and I'd have liked it a little sooner. And what you get from this is just little florets. There was one slightly larger floret. It's kind of like broccoli, but you can see that the florets are reasonably small and you need to pick it quite frequently. And if it starts to make yellow flowers, then you just cut it off and keep going, and it will just keep going and going and going. We're going to work a little bit with this in the kitchen today, but it's proved to be a, a good plant, and having five or six plants of it does give me, us quite a few meals. And uh, it also saves in the refrigerator quite well, so if you need a lot of it, you can just pick it every few days, and by the end of the week, you'll have a meal. Even the uh, youngest leaves on it are quite tender. If you have looked at produce in the store and seen a product called broccolini or bought that product, this is very similar to it. It doesn't have that name, which I think is a uh, company name, proprietary name, but uh, this is about as close as I've seen. And I will definitely try it again next year, starting it a little early. I'm also still getting broccoli and kale and uh, parsnips to dig. And some, uh, I picked the regular celery, but I have cutting celery that's still going strong. I also have lovage, and if I didn't pick any and dry it earlier, I could come out now and pick it. This is great for the Thanksgiving stuffing that I'll be making later on. 
Now let's move over this way a little further. I don't grow sweet corn, but I do sometimes grow a little Indian corn. And this year I decided to try some popcorn, just a few hills. And I'm going to pick it now and we can shuck it. I'm not sure if it's dry enough yet or not. Some nice kernels in there. And what I'll do is pull back the husks as I pick this. And I'm not going to have a tremendous amount, but I'll have enough for a few poppings. And how do you know when it's dry enough? I will be bringing this inside to further dry, but you take a few kernels and pop them and see if they pop. And if they don't pop, keep drying it. I can also cut down these corn shucks. And each uh, plant had a couple of heads of popcorn. Some are larger than others. The ones that have two generally are a little smaller. And we'll see if we can get enough to make a fall decoration. After we take our popcorn off. This is a particularly nice head. Popcorn's kind of fun to grow. Doesn't really require much. And I'm surprised the deer did not go after it, but they didn't. So I did get some. Uh, this is out of my electric fence area. So, but this is a, a variety called buttered, butter popcorn. So we'll see if it tastes like buttered popcorn when we pop it. Now I'm gonna move over to the compost area which is getting a lot of business this season. The pineapple lilies that I grew earlier are looking pretty ragged. So what I'm gonna do is just remove their foliage. And if I had a cool cellar, I would bring this into the cool cellar. But I don't have a cellar, a cool cellar. So what I will do is put it into an unused back bedroom that we keep the heat turned down. And hopefully, I will uh, also stop watering it, maybe give it a little water or check it so that it's barely damp all winter and hope that perhaps they will grow again next year. Again, these are tender bulbs, so we can't leave them out. They won't come back. Any clay pots that you have in the garden, it's time to remove them. I add the soil to the compost, and I've gathered my clay pots here. These will not stay outside. If you leave a clay pot out filled with dirt, very likely it will fill with moisture into the soil, and then the pot will crack. So these I will use the hose to clean, and then store them away in the garden shed. Some of the pots came into the house with their contents in them. I will continue to add, and if I have some dry leaves, and I try to keep a pile right here, every uh, so often I'll layer the fresh things with the dried leaves. That gives us a good combination of brown and green, which is the clue to good composting. My hanging baskets have been removed. I had one hanging on the house, one out on my fence. And I will keep the liners in these baskets as long as I can. Uh, this one may be about ready to go. But these, again, will go into the garden shed for the winter for storage, ready to use again next year. Now, let's go back to the fish pond. We're in the shade garden near the fish pond and garden shed. I've left this plant, uh, which is a, a grass that grows in the shade. It's an oak grass, and it will turn nice uh, beige color, and that can stay up all winter. Uh, it adds a little winter to interest to this area. 
I also have rhododendrons and the uh, carex, which also will stay green all winter, as will the ground covers. I've pulled all the hosta. This area was loaded with hosta, and its leaves were starting to look really shabby, though they weren't quite all browned off. But I've pulled those out because I want to use the leaf blower and blow some of the leaves out of this area. And it's very difficult to do if you have a lot of hosta or sticks. So those need to be picked up first. The shed is getting very full. I do need to save a little spot for uh, working in here to put together some winter decorations, but I've been bringing in lawn decorations, bird houses, and some of the patio furniture. Uh, we rearrange a little about twice a year in here and keep it clean, try to keep it cleared so that there's a work area. When I cleaned and vacuumed in here, I checked everything for any possible mouse nesting sites and I added new mouse magic and I put the date on it when I put it out. This needs to be changed about every three months and what's in this is actually uh, several different kinds of mint and it discourages mice rather than killing them and uh, to kill them if you so choose you can just use old-fashioned traps and that will usually do the job. However, it requires that you check those traps periodically, something that I really don't like to do very much, and especially if we get a lot of snow, I can't even get into the shed necessarily. So I stick with the mouse magic for the most part, unless I know there's an active mouse in here. The pond is still going, and today, of course, yeah, the fish will even want to have a little food because the temperature is fairly high. But what I need to do now is keep checking the temperature on the pond, and I still have the net on. I won't move, remove the net until the leaves have been completely blown off and cleared, and we're ready to put the pond away for the winter. And I have a pond thermometer, and I want to check the temperature of the water. And we're at about 53 degrees right now. It's slightly over 50. Once it drops below 50, I'll know it's time to stop feeding the fish, and then I can clear off the pond and, uh, for the winter and take out my waterfall, my filter, and the tubing and bring that inside for the winter. I could potentially leave it in the garden shed, but I found that the tubing tends to get a little hard if it's left out where it can freeze, and my garden shed will freeze. Uh, temperature will go down. It stays a bit warmer than the outside air, but if we get those 10 and 20 below zero days, things in there will freeze. But for now, I just keep watch of the water temperature, and I would imagine within a week or two, especially if we get uh, more frost and freezing weather, that the temperature will be down sufficiently and going down gradually that I will stop feeding the fish and they will start moving very slowly. If the camera wants to notice, there are two frogs over in one of the plants that I've cut back in the pond. The frogs will stay in. I've left a little hole here and there in the net so that they can escape, so that they aren't trapped in there. If they are trapped in there, they will die, so they do need to get out and do some hunting occasionally. But right now, they're enjoying some nice sunshine today. Now let's go up to the house. It's time to put out your bird feeders. If you don't feed all season, uh, now's a good time to start feeding the birds. They tend to uh, respond to an early feeder put out uh, when they're looking for food. If you put it out only in January, it'll take a long time for the birds to find them. So I like to put it out about now. Uh, the plants that were here throughout the summer have gone inside. This isn't a very fancy way to put this feeder out, but it seems to work. It's near the door, so I can come out and keep it filled. If you feed the birds, you need to make a commitment to it and keep feeding them because they come to depend on the food source that you supply. I'm going to put sunflower seed in this one. At times we've had trouble with raccoons, which is another reason, rather than mounting this on a post, 
I leave it loose because I can come out and take it in for the night and then put it out early in the morning. The birds are not feeding after about five o'clock at night. So if I bring it in, then I know that uh, raccoons and other creatures aren't uh, eating all my seed. The lid fits on and I will probably put a bungee cord around the lid just to hold it in place. Uh, again, I have creatures that sometimes like to take the lid off and consume all the food. I can put suet blocks in here, but at 70 degrees, I really don't want to start putting the suet out because it will kind of melt and get very sticky. Before I put the bird feeders out, I wash them well, uh, hose them off really good, and uh, clean them. And I'll keep filling it with seed as we need to. And it won't be long before we have birds coming to visit. I have another feeder that I have hanging. And again, that one's near the door, and I can reach out and take that in if uh, we have too much squirrel problem with it. The hanging plant that was here all winter now is the centerpiece on my patio table. We've left a few chairs out so that we can use the fire pit uh, on a cool evening. But those will be going soon. As soon as the weather really turns, they'll be going into the garage for the winter. Let's go in and do some cooking. Today I'm going to make some things for Halloween or fall, but uh, I know you probably will be watching this after Halloween this year because of our schedule. However, the things I'm going to make today, you can kind of file away in your memory and think about them next Halloween when that comes along. One of the things that I used to make when my kids were home for Thanksgiving dinner was a stuffed pumpkin. I found the recipe in an old cookbook and I used to make it and I'm going to make a small one today because there's just two of us in the house. The original recipe called for a two to three pound pumpkin and I've probably got enough meat mixture to put in more than this pumpkin but we'll use that another day for something else. I'm starting out with a pound of ground beef that I've already browned and I've also uh, cooked about half a large onion in with it. So I already have that available. To that I'm going to add some breadcrumbs about a half a cup. The original recipe called for rice, but I think I'll like this better. It also was very bland, which is fine when you have uh, children but uh, that are picky. But we like a little more spice, so I'm going to add some uh, pepper and some seasoned salt and some garlic salt. And some Worcestershire. cut it. We'll also add some ketchup, about a tablespoon, and to give it some zip, about the same amount of horseradish. This is kind of like a meatloaf mixture. I have cooked the beef, however, because I don't know that it would get completely cooked if I put it in the oven. I'm going to also add an egg to bind it together. And then we'll just stir this mixture together, mixing our ingredients. It's a little chunky, but remember the uh, pumpkin has a lot of juice in it. So basically what we have is a meatloaf mixture, except I've already cooked the meat. The pumpkin has been hollowed out and washed, and I did save the seeds. And I washed those too, because we can also eat those. And what we'll do is just pack the pumpkin with some of the meat mixture. And again, I probably have a little more than I need, but I'm sure we can Use the rest. Pack it in quite tight. We'll put the lid back on our pumpkin. 
and I'll add about a half a cup of water and that'll be ready to go in the oven. The recipe for a three pound pumpkin, this is about one and a half pounds, calls for 350 for an hour and a half. However, this is about a one and a half pound pumpkin, about half, and so it's not going to take as long, probably 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, I will keep checking it and make sure that the pumpkin meat is tender. This is using pumpkin as a vegetable rather than in a savory dish as we so often see pumpkin used in the fall months. So there we have a stuffed pumpkin. And now I'm going to cook some of the pirisacaba that we picked. And I'll use olive oil in the pan. And we're starting to heat it. And to that I'll add several good sized cloves of garlic. Again, we grew that in the garden. So I'll, and I did grow the pumpkin, by the way. Uh, over by that corn were several pumpkins. So I had small ones. These are small pie pumpkins, but they also can be used for this dish. So we'll start this cooking and we'll brown it a little bit. And I'm also going to add some red pepper, crushed red pepper. We kind of like this. We like somewhat spicy food. If you don't care for a little heat, you can add just regular pepper and a little salt or some seasoned salt. I have to wait a minute while this browns. Okay. Now that we've got the garlic a little sauteed and our pan is nice and hot, I'll add the pirisacaba. Hear it sizzle, and we'll turn it in the oil. Notice I've left some of the stems and leaves on, but the, it has been washed well in salt water to dislodge any unwanted non-vegetable non items. You may need a little more olive oil in here. Start to brown it. Then I'll add a little water and we'll let it cook until it's tender. Turn it down a little. You want it tender crisp, almost like a stir fry. So not too. You'll see it's cooked down quite a bit already. It will cook down even a little more as we continue to cook it. And as a finishing touch on this, I'm going to add a handful of raisins, something a little different, but it does complement the flavor quite nicely. And that would be the pirisacaba with garlic and raisins and hot pepper. And it needs to be reheated a little bit more, but I'm going to leave it this way because this is my supper tonight and I want to have it served hot. Now let's make some Halloween cookies. We're going to start with a pan of brownies, and these can either be from a mix or homemade. These happen to be homemade, but a mix will work just as well, and it's a 9 by 13 pan. And I'm going to jazz these up a little bit with the topping. 
And what I'll put in first will be a half a cup of butter, which I already have in the mixer. I'll add a half a cup of brown sugar. These can be uh, done for any holiday. You could add color if you wished. And I added a half cup of brown sugar and a quarter cup of white sugar. And I'll mix that. These are called cookie dough brownies. And this is the cookie dough without the egg that makes it somewhat dangerous to consume if you're making chocolate chip cookies. To this we will add two tablespoons of milk and a teaspoon of vanilla. Mix that in. And I'll add a cup of flour. Mix that and scrape the bowl a little bit. Mix that thoroughly. We'll clear the beater and I'm going to spread this mixture on the brownies. I'm using an offset spatula to do this. It seems to help. It's a little hard to spread sometimes. But it is possible if you keep working with it. If you have a lot of trouble, you can use just floured fingertips too. And that will also spread it nicely. Kind of depends on how soft the butter was. But we do want to make this into an even layer on the top. Keep smoothing it out until you have a nice even coat on top of the brownies. And the next step is to put this in the refrigerator. And we're going to refrigerate this until the topping becomes very hard. To finish it off, I will melt one cup of chocolate chips with one tablespoon of vegetable shortening and then we'll pour that on top of the layer that's already there and then decorate that however I wish. Uh, I will have a finished product to show you and for Halloween I put candy corn on it which also could be used for Thanksgiving and then uh, when you're ready to serve them you can cut the brownies around the candy corn so space the candy corn or for th uh, you could use green M&Ms for St. Patrick's Day, or candy, candy canes, uh, crushed candy cane, or other candies for Christmas or sprinkles. And it makes a, a very nice brownie that's a little different and a little special. You could also tint the mixture that I just made with the brown sugar, butter, and flour. Uh, you could tint it, I could, for instance, for Halloween, I could have tinted that orange but we have an allergy in our family to food coloring, so I decided maybe orange would not be a good idea this time. Uh, you could also tint it green for St. Patrick's Day, add a little mint flavor to it instead of the vanilla. There's a lot of variations to jazz up your brownies a little bit. The next cookies I'm going to make are little owls for Halloween. They could also be for fall as well. I've already prepared the dough for these cookies, and uh, it's a brown sugar refrigerator cookie dough. Basically, it's a, a butter cookie, and 
I divided the dough into thirds. And one third, I added one and a half tablespoons of chocolate that has been melted and also a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. When you use chocolate in a recipe, often it calls for baking soda because chocolate adds acid to the recipe and you need to balance that with something alkaline, which is baking soda. So we have some chocolate dough and we have some brown sugar dough. And I'm going to roll the brown sugar dough and I want to make an approximately 10 by 4 inch strip and by rolling it into a sausage. I got some of the 10 inch to keep it even. I do use a pastry cloth and a stockinette cover for the rolling pin when I roll things and it makes life a lot easier for me. And there we have our strip. Then we're going to take the chocolate dough and roll it into a long circular piece. This is half of the dough, half of the chocolate and half of the brown sugar dough. We we'll divide it in half. We want to roll it to the same size. Looks like a And we'll put that on top of this dough. We move it in a little bit and roll a little bit longer. Then I'm going to wrap this dough around it. This gives us a, a center that's chocolate surrounded by a brown sugar area. I'll pinch these together. Form it into a nice roll. We'll wrap this in some plastic wrap. And it's going to go in the refrigerator. Right now it's pretty soft, so you could roll it, but it'll go in the refrigerator. Incidentally, uh, you can wa you wash the cover, the rolling pin cover, and the stockinette, the stockinette cover, and the rolling pin canvas do get washed after every use. I just put it away temporarily to get it out of my way. I have some of the dough that's already been in the refrigerator. What I'm going to do is slice it into thin slices, about a quarter of an inch. And you'll note that we have our chocolate center. And I'm going to put this on the baking sheet. And I'm going to put two cookies together and kind of pinch them together. We'll continue that. Turn them a little bit. You want the middle to fit together, and then I'm going to pinch little ears up to make little owl faces. You just pinch one side up. Then to finish our owls, 
going to use a cashew nut for a beak. Make sure you pinch them together and pinch this into the dough. Otherwise they do come apart. They still taste good. This is the beak for the uh, owl. And then I'll use a regular sized chocolate chip for the eyes. These are going to go in the oven at uh, 350, oh, for about 8 to 10 minutes until they're cooked. And you'll see the results a little later. I have some that I've already done. Move this over here. These are the pumpkin seeds if you want a snack that's not sweet. And the pumpkin seeds were done from the pumpkin and I've washed them good to get all the pumpkin goo off and then I've put them out on parchment paper and these will go in the oven at 350 or 325 for about an hour to dry and then I'll add a little oil and salt and roast them for 10 or 15 minutes more and we have a nice little pumpkin snack. I have one more cookie to do only it isn't really a cookie it's more of a confection because it's made with candies. And marshmallows. Tinted some coconut green, and I've uh, got some vanilla frosting, and some of it I have tinted orange and put into a, a pastry bag with a little star piece. And we're going to take our marshmallow. And there's a white cup on this, I think. And I'll use a little bit of the uh, frosting around the sides of the marshmallow. Just with the knife. This is going to be our witch's hair, green hair, for Halloween. And then using a toothpick, I'll use a little frosting and make three little dots on it. And I'll use mini chocolate chips for eyes and mouth. Put a little more hair on. I've got some of these that are I already had ready. Now I have some chocolate wafer cookies, and uh, these would be about the size of a chocolate vanilla wafer or, or vanilla wafer, but you could also use the large marshmallows. In fact, the recipe called for the large ones. I had these on hand, so I used these. But the large marshmallows and the larger wafers would work just as well. I'm going to put a dab of frosting in the center of each one. And unwrap a mini peanut butter cup. And we're making hats for our witches. Be sure to take the paper off. Whoever eats them won't be too thrilled to get paper under their chocolate kiss that goes on next. And again, a little dab of frosting. These are a no-bake project. Pretty much as all the things are available in the store, even the frosting. And I'm putting a chocolate kiss on for the top of the hat. You can leave it like that or pipe a bit of orange around it to give it a little color. Then using uh, another little bit of frosting on top of the marshmallow. 
which you did not put coconut on, on purpose. And we put the hat on the witch, and there you have a little witch, a marshmallow witch. So we have our Halloween meal. Through the magic of television, we have our persicaba, our baked stuffed pumpkin, and for dessert, get her to stand up a little bit, our witch, our owl, and our brownie with the candy corn on top. Thank you for joining me today for a walk in the garden. Hope to see you soon for our next episode on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable. Thank you.